Concerning Josephus, please allow me to introduce you to Paul Mayer, who is a wonderful scholar, and this is on Josephus, and <clears throat> me and Bisto have been talking back and forth about Josephus. Uh, unfortunately, Bisto has not responded to the two videos that I made for him. Here's about a 10 minute segment of someone who is not me, who is not of my denomination, who is giving one of the, he's a far better speaker than me and his, uh, well, listen and marvel basically. But so does Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, never turned Christian. But he writes sober history as he sees it. He also reports John the Baptist's execution exactly like the Gospels do. He even adds precious detail to the Gospel record. Yeah, I'm telling you, these outside sources from the secular world are very valuable because they not only coordinate with the biblical record, but they add neat detail in some cases Threads that have been left hanging in the Bible are tied down by Josephus. Incredible character. He was a genius. No fact escaped him. He wrote this enormous history of the Jewish people, 28 book scrolls. He wrote 28 times the size of material in one gospel. So here we get all the delicious detail that beautifully completes our picture of Jesus and his times in the New Testament. Now, case of John the Baptist. Where did he get executed? And don't some wise guy say at the neck. Yeah, we understand that. Where was the place where it happened geographically? Well, Josephus tells us it happened at Machairus, which was the fortress palace of Herod the Great, at the northeastern corner of the Dead Sea. Now, it's important to know where things happen, right? And the Gospels don't tell us where it happened. Josephus does. I'm not knocking the Gospels. I'm trying to point out they're dealing in historical fact here, so much so that a non-Christian will report the same thing about what you find in the Gospel. Hey, Josephus even, even, in fact, I'm going to prove that all of you have used Josephus. You probably never heard of him before he came to see me. Joe who people usually respond when I talk about Josephus. First century Jewish historian, born in the city of Jerusalem, four years after Jesus' crucifixion. He is a box outside seat to the events reported in the Gospels. If I were going to ask you, who, what's the name of the little gal, daughter of Herodias, who did her dance of how many, many veils or whatever that is, that caused the death of John the Baptist. Altogether now, what's the name of the gal? Salome, you say correctly, that's right. And now you'll be shocked. You can't find her name in the New Testament. All you get for the beheading of John the Baptist is daughter of Herodias. How do we know her name, Salome? <clears throat> Thank you, Josephus. See how beautifully the evidence coordinates? Who was the first bishop of the Christian church anywhere on earth. And don't give me Simon Peter. He was not. The first bishop of the church, according to the Bible itself, was James the Just of Jerusalem, Jesus' half-brother or cousin. We're not going to get in that argument right now. But Eusebius, the earliest Christian church historian, says it was James. And indeed, we wish the New Testament would finish off his history, but it doesn't. Guess who does? Josephus. He says that 29 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, was stoned to death by the Sanhedrin in the absence of the Roman governor, guy who hadn't gotten her yet, who tried to do exactly what Pontius Pilate tried to do, and that is get Jesus off the hook. But Albinus, his name was, he arrived too late. By that time, they'd done a kangaroo court execution on James, the half-brother of Jesus, and here you have <clears throat> Good Friday 2. You have a perfect parallel to Good Friday. Good Friday 1, 
You have Caiaphas, the, whose bones have just been discovered, who is the prosecutor. In 62 AD, 29 years later, you have Caiaphas' brother-in-law, Ananus, uh, who again see, saw that this stoning to death was kind of railroaded. But here you have again a perfect confirmation, a perfect mirror of what happened on Good Friday. And by the way, the second one was by a Jew who never converted to Christianity, so he's not some sweet gospel writer trying to make the New Testament look good. This authenticates the evidence even more strongly. And of course, in the famous passage, Antiquities, book 1863, section 63, Josephus gives us the longest reference to Jesus in first century sources outside of Christian literature. Is in the middle of the reign of Pontius Pilate. And by the way, Josephus gives us about five major episodes in the life of Pontius Pilate, which are not in the Bible. And they're real. They happened. They explain why Pilate is acting so strangely on Good Friday, why he seems under pressure. Here's the answer Josephus gives us. This guy has not been mined enough for all the gold nuggets there inside. So anyway, right in the middle of Pilate's administration, he gave this wonderful testimony to Jesus, almost in Christian language. In fact, it was too good to be true. Yeah. My colleagues in the ministry or in the rabbinate will know that uh, everybody agrees that passage had been interpolated. Somebody thinking to do God a favor took a perfectly decent passage on Jesus and baptized it, made it too Christian for words. Now the passage read something like this. About this time there was a wonderful man, if indeed one ought to call him only a man. He was the Messiah who rose from the dead. Now look, a good Jew would never have written that and stayed a good Jew. He would have been a Jewish Christian like Paul of Tarsus. So we were told never to use that uh, in the, uh, at the seminary. So, wind the clock back to 1955. I just graduated from Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Young pup of a grad student. I was so ticked off that this largest reference to Jesus had been screwed up that I wrote the world's ranking authority in Flavius Josephus, a Jewish scholar in London named Paul Winter. And I asked Dr. Winter two questions. One. Do you think that Josephus ever referred to Jesus because the critics were saying, throw the whole passage out? Second question, if you think he really referred to Jesus, how do you think the passage read? Three weeks later, got an airmail letter. This does nothing for you people, either instant messaging. I know, I know. They cut me some slack. 55 years ago. Okay. Uh, Answer to the first question, yes, he was quite sure that Josephus was referring to our Jesus. Second question, using his good textual critical skills, he prized away what he thought was a Christian uh, addenda by some stupid monk in the second century or something, and uh, gave me a version that I thought was very convincing. Tragedy, Paul Winter died before he ever learned how close he had come because the great good news is that another great Jewish scholar, uh, Shlomo Pines of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, discovered a manuscript tradition of Josephus that was not interpolated at that point. It reads almost word for word like what Paul Winter predicted it would read if they ever got the accurate manuscript. So in my translation of Josephus, that goes back in the text. And it's only at the end of the chapter that we have the rather Sunday schoolish laundered version that we can't accept. And that is a very fair outside view of Jesus by someone who didn't necessarily believe in him, but he's trying to write fair history. Goes something like this. About this time, there was a wise man called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and the other nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles, the other nations, became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon their discipleship. They reported that three days later, he emerged from the tomb alive. Now, 
Notice he doesn't say he rose from the dead. He said they reported that he rose from the dead. See, that's the New Testament says the same thing. So he's trying to be fair. That's something a good Jew could have written that he ends up by saying, uh, accordingly, he could possibly have been the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders. And the tribe of the Christians so named after him has not disappeared to the present day. So this is what he actually wrote. And so this brilliant outside testimony for like, the, the historicity of Jesus, and there are five other major references, about 12 in all, but five other major references in secular literature about Jesus. So how somebody can come along and claim that Jesus was only a myth, I shall never know. Uh, just quickly to tick them off. Cornelius Tacitus, first century historian, he writes from the second century and the first, gives us a year-by-year -year account of what happened in ancient Rome. And for the year 64, he reports the great fire of Rome happened under Nero's administration. And Nero's throne is tottering because it happened on his watch. So to keep from being overthrown, Nero then has to search for other scapegoats. And he lands on the Christians. First time they show up in secular history. He says... The Christians are named, careful scholar, he says, the Christians are named for a Christ who was crucified by one of our governors, Pontius Pilate. And the pernicious superstition was almost eradicated, but suddenly it gained new vigor again. You want an outside proof for the resurrection and Pentecost? There it is. Suddenly it gained new vigor and even flowed as far away as Rome, that common cesspool into which garbage flows from all over the Mediterranean. So here's a hostile source, doesn't like Christianity, so much garbage. But that very fact alone proves that his concession, that there was a Jesus crucified by Pilate and had followers, is absolutely authentic historically. Because it satisfies the great criterion of embarrassment. Hey, I'll get over these sidebars in a second. But listen, i got to give you a couple sidebars here on how does a professor of ancient history figure out if something claimed 2,000 years later really happened? The guy may be padding a story, may be telling a fairy tale. We know the ancients love to pad their numbers, the historians. So how do we know that a fact claimed by an ancient historian is true. There are 12 tests, but two of the biggest. First is the criterion of multiple attestation, meaning are there a lot of different sources not copying from one another that agree that this happened? Then that's a pretty firm. I mean, a lot of people say Julius Caesar assassinated Ides of March, Julius Caesar, and it keeps going around. And yeah, probably happened. The other one is the criterion of embarrassment. You're arguing in a given direction, and yet you come across evidence that contradicts your thesis. But you got to admit it because everybody knows it's true, but you build a wall around it trying to explain it away, right? Then 2,000 years later, that problematical counter evidence is absolutely authentic. See it? See, otherwise, they wouldn't have been bothered to defeat the argument. So here in a hostile source, it would have been in their interest to shut up about Jesus entirely. Tacitus thinks there's so much sewage. But he was an honest historian trying to figure out where this crazy sect started, okay? This is pretty overpowering evidence. Tacitus alone would prove the historicity of Jesus. But we have more. Suetonius, another famous Roman historian, writes uh, Lives of the Twelve Caesars, gives quite a bedroom history of them and so forth. Uh, it was a bestseller in the Middle Ages. Do you want me to keep going? Um, I mean, I can. I've been talking about these sources for 10 years, uh, but this man speaks far more eloquent than me. Wait, that's uh, the way it usually goes. But he says in the reign of Claudius, there was a big uh, demonstration riot in the Trans-Tiber area in Rome over the claims of Christ. Yeah. Pliny the Younger, governor of Asia Minor, he was uh, across from the Bosporus and the 
Asiatic side of Istanbul. That's where Bithynia is located, northwestern Turkey. He writes the Emperor Trajan about the year 110, and he says, uh, Dear Emperor, what do I do about these Christians? They get up, get up early Sunday morning and they sing hymns to Christ as if he were a god. You know, so much for Dan Brown's claim this happened at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, 225 years later, uh-uh, <laughs> early on. What do we do about them? They're against the law, aren't they? We got Trajan's answer. He said, dear Pliny, yes, the Christians are against the law. And so if you can make a perfect case against them, I guess the law has got to be followed. But don't go hunting them out and don't take any unsigned accusations which are inconsistent with the liberality of our age. See, there is a case where the Roman Empire is moderating. See, the persecutions were not one long horror story. They were on again, off again, on again, off again. But again, Jesus, as God mentioned Christ and so forth. The Jewish rabbinic traditions mention Jesus. They're hostile also. But they admit there was a Yeshua Hanotsri, Jesus of Nazareth. They even give us the arrest notice published by the Sanhedrin for his arrest. Or something like this. Wanted Yeshua Hanotsri. He shall be stoned because he's practiced sorcery and he lured Israel into apostasy. Now, again, you might hip, quick, shoot reaction, might say, wait a minute, this is no good. Jesus was crucified, he wasn't stoned. And isn't it terrible to call the Lord's miracles sorcery? No, for those two reasons, it's authentic. Future tense is used in this Aramaic inscription. Future tense, haven't arrested Jesus yet. No Jew would ever written, he's going to be crucified. That's a Roman punishment. If they'd have caught Jesus anywhere but Jerusalem, any time, except for when the Romans were there, how would they have terminated him? Stoning! Penalty for blasphemy! Rabbis have this wonderful account about how God's creating angels went across the world to create the world. Angel in charge of the forest, dot, 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 studded in all the trees. Angel in charge of the seas, poured out the oceans. Angel in charge of the rocks, however, hit some headwinds flying over the Holy Land. Had to drop them all there. It's the weapon of choice. Anybody's been at the Holy Land, is that right? Limestone outcroppings all over the place. It's the rockiest spot on earth. So this is realistic. And folks, did you notice the criterion of embarrassment showing up in that in that statement? Sometimes I'm asked, can we prove the miraculous? Well, obviously, not to everyone's satisfaction. This one comes close. He's practiced sorcery. Now, wait a minute. Wouldn't it have been simpler for that hostile source not to mention that? Because sorcery and miracle are the same thing if you're not talking cause. A miracle is something extraordinary or supernatural with help from above. Sorcery is the same thing with help from below. But in conceding that Jesus is doing something extraordinary or supernatural from a hostile source, this becomes very, very important testimony. And I will, so, uh, uh, there, there's a lot more um, that um, Paul Mayer has to say uh, a lot more and if you want the full video it'll be linked below but I figured that part about Josephus uh, because there's too many Julianists anti-theists even moderate atheists um, who are mythicists or who have no respect for uh, history who want to throw out everything that um, Josephus wrote about Jesus or James or John the Baptist or I should say and in all those cases because of an interpolation that was made by a copyist now he says in the second century I find that hard it's probably later than that uh, but yeah, so 
there it is. I mean, we do have, and I've been mentioning this. I mean, I've known about this my whole life because this was discovered decades before I was born. Um, a manuscript that does not have that that interpolation in there. So peace to you. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope this has enlightened some people. Uh, I know some will still say, no, they're all forgeries. But I mean, these are, these are people who don't believe that, you know, Alexander the Great existed or that, uh, you know, they, they don't believe Charlemagne or Charles Martel existed. I mean, it's, it's really, really weird, nutty stuff. Now, when it comes to Muhammad, uh, his, the attestation of his existence, that gets harder. But Jesus um, is the, is the most provable histor uh, uh, character from history, from antiquity. He is the most attested to. It is not an option to say that he didn't exist. You can deny his divinity. You can say he didn't resurrect, that his body was stolen, but this apocalyptic preacher that was called the Messiah or the Christ, that was hated by the Sanhedrin and executed under Pontius Pilate by way of the cross, and after three days, um, his body disappeared and his, his followers believed that he resurrected. That is not in dispute. Peace to you.